are now ready to begin. Good morning. So, we're going to continue what we were doing yesterday. I mean, yesterday we sort of talked about absolute extrema, absolute maxima, and absolute minima. And we made some points about where those absolute maxima or absolute minima occur. What we said in particular is that those absolute extrema occur either at the end points of the interval we're looking at. Remember that we are looking at continuous functions on closed intervals. So these absolute extrema occur at the end points or they occur at critical values. And we defined critical values, but let's remind ourselves they're the values where the derivative is zero or where the derivative does not exist. But these aren't, I mean, these are candidates for where the absolute extrema could occur. Just because you have a critical value, it doesn't mean there's an absolute extrema there. And we saw that yesterday with x cubed. x cubed had a critical value at zero, but on the interval we were looking at, at least, zero was not a <coughs> maximum or a minimum. So, That still leaves us with the question, how do we find absolute extrema? And it's not, I mean, assuming that you internalize it, and assuming that the derivatives aren't too ugly, it's a pretty straightforward process. Step one is going to be to find the critical values. And here's where that remark I just made came in about the derivatives not being too ugly. To find critical values, you have to find the derivative and set it equal to zero. And you know that setting a function equal to zero, at least if you're working by hand, which admittedly you wouldn't be in most applications, but if you're working by hand, setting expressions equal to zero can be very non-trivial. But you have to find the critical values. And then you plug in the critical values and the end points. And plug in, plug into what? Into the function f of f. 
and we'll demonstrate how this works with a pseudo example, and then we'll do a real example. So our pseudo example. And what makes this pseudo is that we're not going to give a function. We'll just say that we have f of x on the interval from 0 to 3. And suppose 1 is the only critical value. then you would create a table in which you have the endpoints and you have your critical values. And your table is whatever it is. Maybe f of 0 is 3, f of 1 is 2, f of 3 is 9. Again, we'll do a real example with a real f in a moment. But once you've constructed that table, you just look at, look at the values. I mean, according to the extreme value theorem, assuming f is continuous, there should be a minimum. And that minimum is either at 0, or at 1, or at 3. And we look at the values, they're 3 to 9, and 2 is the minimum of those values. Similarly, there ought to be a maximum, and it's one of these three values, so the maximum is either at 0, or at 1, or at 3. And you just look at this, and you say, well, of the values of f of x, 3, 2, and 9, nine is the maximum, so the maximum occurs at 3. And the maximum then is the point three nine, and the minimum is the point one two. So that's how the process occurs. You have a finite number of critical values. You have a finite number of endpoints. So you can just look at all of them individually yeah. and ask, OK, well, here are our candidates. Where's f of x at its maximum? Where's f of x at its minimum? That's the process kind of in generality, but probably until we see a concrete example, we might still have doubts. That's that f of x equal x squared minus x plus one on the interval from negative one to two. 
we're still in the make these problems up at, on, um, stage of things. We'll look at applications in a later section. For now, we have this quadratic. We want to find the maximum and the minimum values on this interval. So, first, we need to find the candidates. And two of our candidates are just sitting there. The endpoints can be absolute extrema, so we're going to have to end up checking negative 1 and 2. But those aren't perhaps the only candidates. If there are critical values, those are candidates as well. So are there critical values and Perhaps more to the point, are there critical values in the interval that we're looking at? If there's a critical value at 3, who cares, right? We're not looking at 3, we're looking at this interval. Well, finding critical values is done by investigating the derivative. So 2x minus 1. And finding critical values involves asking two unrelated questions. The first question is when the derivative equals zero. The second question is when the derivative does not exist. And Nine times out of ten, maybe closer to ninety-nine times out of a hundred, the derivative is going to exist everywhere, and it's just going to be a matter of setting something equal to zero. And that's true here. I mean, 2x minus 1 is a linear function. It's defined on the entire real number line. So, in particular, it's defined everywhere on this interval. So, as is so often the case, that doesn't give us anything. That never shows up. And finding the critical values is a matter of setting 2x minus 1 equal to 0. So 2x equals 1, x equals 1 half. And one half is in the interval we're looking at. One half is between negative one and two, so it's a real candidate that we can't ignore. And that gives us three values that we need to test. Everybody with me so far, 
I should ask. So we're going to be sticking our candidates into the original function f of x. We are not, in particular, sticking them into the derivative f prime of x. That's a mistake that I often see. So. Negative one, one half, and two. And at this point, the problem just becomes rather tedious. You're going to prob the reach for your, well, this is simple enough that we could do this in our head, really, but most of the time you're probably going to reach for your calculator. That's negative one squared is one, minus negative one is two, plus one is three. Um, two squared is four, minus two is two, plus one, three again. I wasn't doing that intentionally, but... Doesn't the first one just be negative one? You Either might well negative be... Negative one minus one would be negative two plus one. Um, so negative one squared minus negative one plus one. Um, a negative as times a negative is positive, minus a negative is also positive, plus one is three. Let's see, one half is messier, uh, one fourth minus one half plus one. Honestly, it might have been easier to just bury our pride and use the calculator, but I'm committed now. So, um, one half squared is one fourth minus one half plus one. Um, get a common denominator. One fourth is one fourth. One half is two fourths, one is four fourths. So four fourths plus one fourth is five fourths minus two is three fourths. And this wasn't really my intention to wind up with every value being an absolute extrema. It just sort of worked out that way because of these values. Three is the maximum value. And that maximum of value three shows up twice. And then three fourths is the minimum of those values. So everything ended up being a maximum or a minimum. That's uh Let's take a look. Let's see. Sorry, I keep. It's never my intention to show like 
political news in this class. I just forget that that, that browser does that. Oh, Lord. go away. Uh, sorry for the online students trying to figure out what's happening. Firefox is being an enormous nuisance that's making me skip like seven different steps. But here we are in Desmos, x squared minus x minus one. Plus one, right? Yeah, x squared minus x plus one on the interval from negative one to two. And, yep, this is. This is the graph, and its maximum value of 3 does indeed appear twice, and a minimum value down here does indeed occur at 1 half. So that works. And again, I mean, technology is making or never going to change the math curriculum because all of the people who write books are like 70 years old and convinced that they know what they're doing. Obviously, there are elements of this that have been rendered slightly ludicrous by technology. It took five seconds to go to Desmos and find these maxima and minima. No calculus required. But there is some value, I think, in understanding the underlying mechanism of what your calculator or what Desmos is doing. Even if in a lot of situations these hand computations would be replaced with technological manipulation. We can do another example. Or maybe I'll do another example, and then I'll have you do another example. Let's find the absolute extrema of f of x equals x e to the x on the interval from negative 1 to 2. I've always liked this example, just complicated enough that you have to fight for it, but not so complicated that you spend 20 minutes of class time staring at derivatives and trying to set stuff to zero. To find the absolute extrema, we need the critical value. And now that we've done one example, we'll maybe write down fewer words on the whiteboard. So we need the critical values. To do that, we'll find the derivative 
we'll ask when it exists, we'll ask when it equals zero. And as I say, I was very hardened by the test. People don't really seem to be struggling with these day-to-day -day derivatives, but don't sort of slack off now, I guess. Remember, you have to use the product rule because you have x times e to the x. So the derivative of x is 1 times e to the x plus, and now when you have these natural exponentials, it always looks like you're forgetting to take a derivative, but remember that e to the x is its own derivative. So um, we are using the product rule correctly here. And um, this, this is always defined. I mean, I don't know if I say, th I say things like that as though they should be obvious. I don't know if they are obvious, but I mean, you could go to Desmos, for example. And you could look at e to the x, plus x e to the x on the interval, what interval are we on? On the interval from negative 1 to 2? And if we zoom out, if we let y be bigger, yeah, this, this derivative always exists. There are no vertical asymptotes here or anything like that. The derivative is just this function. It's defined here, it's defined at all of these intermediate points, and it's defined on the right end point. So this derivative always exists, meaning that finding the critical values is just a matter of setting it equal to zero. And there are a few ways you could sort of approach this problem. Um, we see e to the x show up twice is maybe, maybe the first thing that I notice. So if e to the x shows up twice, we can factor it out. Huh. So, uh, again, there are a few ways to kind of think of this. Um, we could divide both sides by e to the x. And the reason we can divide both sides by e to the x is that e to the x is never zero. Usually when you do that kind of step, you have, I mean, if you divided both sides by one plus x, one plus x can be zero right, if x is negative 1, and then that division would give you a division by 0 error. That doesn't come up with e to the x. e to the x is never 0. Or if you remember your fancy phrases from algebra, you could use the zero product property. 
we're multiplying two things together. If their product is zero, that means that one of the things you're multiplying is zero. And then e to the x is never zero, so that leaves you with this. Okay, I keep saying e to the x is never zero. It's like a validity. What if that isn't obvious to you? What if you don't remember that e to the x is never zero? Well, then, I mean, assuming you remember your algebra, you can try to solve this equation. If e to the x is zero, then x equals the natural logarithm of zero. And when you go to your calculator and you say, okay, what's the natural logarithm of zero? Well, you get an error. The natural logarithm of zero doesn't exist, and that's why e to the x is never zero. So, however, you come to this realization, you eventually get x. equals negative one. And I somehow keep ending up with these slightly weird examples. Um, the previous problem was a little weird because everything was an extrema. This is a little weird because we already had negative one as a candidate. We already knew that we had to check negative one because we have to check the endpoints of the interval. So all of that messing around and how do we know this and how do we know that? And we ended up with a number that we already had. Well, that sometimes happens. So We're looking at x, e to the x. Remember that we're plugging stuff into the original function. Our candidates are our endpoints, negative 1 and 2, and our critical values, but our critical value is an endpoint. So that just leaves us with negative one and two. And unless you can do a two e squared in your head, we have no choice but to go to our calculator this time. So it was negative e to the negative 1, negative 0.368, and Two e squared fourteen point seven seven eight. And now <coughs> 
Now you're just comparing those numbers. One of them <coughs> one of them has to be the minimum, one of them has to be the maximum. Well, the minimum is the smallest value and negative 0.368 is clearly the smaller of those two numbers. Positive 14.778 is clearly the largest of those two numbers. So there's door min and there's door max. In the time we have remaining, why don't, why don't we throw out an example for you to do? Let's see. We'll at least For today, try to keep our examples relatively harmless. So uh, remember that I'm not going to be here tomorrow. Got jury selection. No idea if I'll be here Thursday. It depends on if they select me. I'll let you know. But there will be video content for you to look at where we do more complicated examples, maybe. And then Thursday, I will hope about. Well, I guess I don't really care if I get called. Sort of uh, made some minor algebraic errors. So let's take a quick look at the critical values. No, that was right. 3x squared minus 2x <coughs> And we're setting this equal to zero. We can pull out an x. And now it has to be the zero product property. Um, which, I mean, is a very fancy way of saying we factored the polynomial, and we're using that to find its roots. So x could be 0, or 3x minus 2 could be 0. giving us two critical values. They're both in the interval. It's always important to check that. If you have a critical value outside of this interval, it is not a factor in the problem. So, f of x equals x cubed minus x squared. And our candidates are negative 3 0 2 thirds positive 2 So our critical values and our endpoints.
I never really like to do sort of TI-84 specific stuff because, because frankly, I don't like Texas Instruments. They got a monopoly and have been exploiting people with it for a long time now. But if you have a... Uh, if you have a bunch of critical values, you can use your calculator. If you have a TI-83, TI-84, to check them quickly. You go to your calculator. You enter this in as if you're going to graph it. And then instead of graph, you see the word table in blue above graph. <coughs> if you press second table, you get a table of values. This isn't really useful for us because um, it's generating these x values automatically. They're not what we care about. If we go to table settings, which if you didn't see, I pressed the blue second button and then I pressed the window button. You can say, hey, I want to input these values myself. And then when we go back to the table, we can now enter our values. And they were negative three, zero, two thirds, two. Negative three, zero, two-thirds, two, and of these values, negative 36, zero, negative zero, point one four eight and four, negative 36 is the minimum, and four is the maximum. So, after all that work, finding the critical values, neither of them ended up being what we were looking for in this problem. All right, check the announcements. That's where I'll post a link to whatever video I have for you. Um, we're still planning to cover all of the material we're scheduled to cover this week. So there will be two quizzes. You can start on one of them. You might be able to finish the quiz on Absolute Extrema. The other material will cover Thursday. And I will see you either Thursday or Monday, depending on whether the court decides they want me in the jury box.